Hello my fellow pilots and welcome again to another episode of Star Citizen FM, episode 51. Star Citizen FM is your fan community source relating to anything to Star Citizen, the community, or anything else in the verse that might catch your fancy. Star Citizen FM is hosted by yours truly, Dr. Hawk. So join me as we recap this short little week and see if we can find any interesting tidbits. This week can be summed up as fairly uneventful. There's a few things going on in the ASA dev forums as the everybody is now using them to the fullest extent, so you can always check out the ASCA dev forums if you'd like to find out anything related to Star Citizen. We had a few extra lore builder articles come out, a galactic guide article which I'll be reading over, and our usual uh, Wingman's Hangar episode 52, as well as another 10 for the chairman. Not a whole lot to really go over, but at the same time we do have, you know, enough. <laughs> at the same time I can show off some of the cool concept art here that we got from the Gideon system. For those of you that aren't actually familiar with it, the Gideon system is one of the original system unlocks from the launch campaign, or post-launch camp launch campaign. So it's very exciting to see the additional locations that they imagined a year ago coming to fruition. For the hell of it, I'm going to give a read-through for the Gideon system. Its ownership is by the Banu Protectorate. One planet. It has a planetary rotation of 299 SED. Its main import is food. Exports are black glass. Black glass. Wow, I'll say that five times fast. Gray oil. And its crime status is low. Its black market, however, is through chemicals, and the UEE strategic value is green. Geddon is a system of a Banu Protect Protectorate, I will get that eventually, located two jumps behind the Perry Line. It is home to a single planet, Tatko. Tatko is a barren, wind-swept mass of volcanic rock. It's no place for a human being, certainly not one without a light pressure suit but it's the ideal environment for the Banu. The planet's churning underground volcanoes help produce the system's main exports. Black glass for producing circuitry and gray oil, and the so-called planet blood, which is used as a high-end space engine lubricant. Both products are exceptionally pure. The Tatco seal graphic, which confirms their place of origin, is the mark of highly respected products. The weather patterns on Tatco are turbulent at best, lethal on the average day. Therefore, the cities are massive enclosed arcologies, driven deep into the planet's surface, nicknamed spires by UEE travelers due to their resemblance to massive spikes driven into the planet. Docking at a spire can be exceptionally difficult. Starship accidents during landing here are common. The polar regions of Tatco are a source of bad ice, a highly illegal frozen combination of water and refinable poisons. I find it fairly interesting that they're bringing up the topic of poisons. What would we have as star citizens to use poisons for? Could we potentially poison another pilot at a bar? Could it be used to potentially gas out a ship during boarding? Or is it just a commodity that would have a high value that market moguls would use and sell for profit? We won't know in the meantime, but when I do have information for you guys, I'll be sure to let you know if you should be smelling for any burnt almond smell from your beer. The other interesting article that we had come up was related to Drake Interplanetary. Uh, this one should be interesting for any of you space pirates out there. Any citizen knows Drake Interplanetary. The cheesy billboards featuring impossibly plastic women with garish skin and dye jobs leaning over the latest model starfighters. The news vid headlines about frustrated investigations into their criminal ties. The not so quite aerodynamic look of their silhouettes. The company's footprint is pervasive and unavoidable for anyone who enters space. The Cutlass. Drake's keystone design is the Drake Interplanetary AS-1 Cutlass. Incredibly inexpensive, the Drake Cutlass is used across the galaxy for thousands of different roles. From search and rescue ambulances, to mining prospector conversions, to short hop food transports. The modular nature of the Cutlass means it can be anything to anyone. But there's no denying the fact that it's best known for the vehicle of choice for those skirting the law, and those outright defying it. 
piracy has a corporate face, it is Drake Interplanetary. The Cutlass beginnings aren't as sinister as its present status. It was initially developed to UEE specifications as a candidate for their 2922 Volksfighter specifications. The specs were for a low-cost, configurable space fighter that could be constructed rapidly to outfit distant home defense squadrons if, to in, t if in times of need. The Cutlass lost out in the bidding to the now-forgotten Wildcat, but the development team opted to reappropriate the design for civilian use. The Cutlass was a spectacular design. All things considered, it lacked the leather seats and silver highlights of an origin luxury spacecraft and the hard reliability of a Robert Space Industries design. But it could be built quickly using materials common on nearly every inhabitable planet for roughly a quarter of the cost of any other comparable spacecraft. And for that, it was profoundly reliable. Famous test hollows show the prototype Cutlass fearlessly navigating a field of stellar debris. Incorporation Drake Interplanetary Incorporated soon after, Lead designer Jean Dredge became CEO, with a seven-member board consisting largely of aerospace engineers who had worked hard on the project. Drake was not the surname of anyone involved in the project. It was selected as an acceptably smooth-sounding name, chosen specifically in the hopes that it would make their spacecraft more appealing. This was the first of a series of money-over-all decisions that would quickly come to define the company. The second decision was also telling. Rather than incorporate on one of the UEE's traditional homeworlds, like Earth or Terra, Drake based itself in the economically embattled system of Magnus. Basing both corporate governance and key factories on Borea, Magnus II, Drake's outlaw image became well established before the first production model Cutlass left the factory floor. The initial pitch was to private militia groups. UEE law allows, and some would say encourages, anyone anywhere to own armed spacecraft and so the plan was that private squadrons in more distant areas of the galaxy would welcome a low-cost spacecraft solution. Regions specifically classified high insurance risks the Drake board reasoned would especially welcome an easier way to replenish lost spacecraft. They were right, or so it seemed. Sales were phenomenal. Within nine months, Drake had opened six off-world factories and had licensed dealerships in nine systems. In another year, the company had quadrupled again, Within five years, they were the fifth largest spacecraft manufacturing concern and couldn't license subsystem manufacturers quickly enough. The company was lauded as a massive business success, credited in financial magazines as the little engine that could, finally a competitor that could change how companies like Robert Space Industries and Muashi Indust Industrial ran their businesses. From the numbers alone, it looked like everyone would be fly flying a cutlass in ten years. Partners in Crime Somehow, no one stopped to notice that that wasn't really the case. The galaxy was at peace, or as close to peace as it had ever been. Vanduul raids at the time were disorganized, brush wars on frontier colonies were limited in scope, and the UEE military was in the middle of a several year stand down. Who was buying thousands upon thousands of cutlasses, and what were they doing with them? As long as the star credits kept coming in, nobody at Drake was especially interested. The answer, of course, was pirate organizations. As long as civilians have had access to the stars, piracy has flourished. And now, thanks to the affordable Cutlass, it had a new tool of choice. Smugglers and pirates, long cut off from the standard insurance system available to citizens, had mostly been operating with obsolete discards. An armada of varied designs, including patchwork constellation Mark Ones, military surplus strike hawks, and even century-old MISC flying wings. Now, they had a readily replaceable spacecraft that fit their budget, and thanks to its larger-than-average cargo hold, an extremely customizable nature, one that fits their needs exactly. An analysis found that cutlasses were suddenly transporting narcotics, raiding cargo convoys, and even daring to engage police patrols with increasing frequency. In time, the bulky, modular look of the cutlass would even come to redefine pirates as much as pirates did the Cutlass, giving new life to a very old profession. Here is where the corporate account, which proclaims Drake's astounding efforts to stop piracy and their dedication to making spacecraft available to all sentients, differs from reality. It has become clear, though wholly unacknowledged, 
that the company realized they had made a deal with the devil, and that the money was too good to step back. Instead of restricting Cutlass sales to recognized military units, they began designing spacecraft with an increasingly piratical bent. The Caterpillar transport, for instance, mounted more tractor beams and heavy weapons than anything in the same class. Advertising became more obvious as well, with showroom model cutlasses appearing in black stealth schemes and skull and crossbones logos, a quote-unquote tongue-in-cheek reference to the overblown controversy, corporate PR explained. The future. What does the future hold for Drake? CEO Dredge plans to unveil next year's spacecraft lineup at the Terra Air and Space Show next month, and the rumor is that this year's models are all about streamlining, a daunting task for the modular Boxy Cutlass, Caterpillar, and Buccaneer. Could ship models finally be going for a look and feel over affordability? Could it signal a move away from tact approval of their use by illicit operators? A corporate representative is quick to point out that the company spent millions lobbying the UEE government for harsher anti-piracy laws, but the cynic can't help but realize that more anti-piracy forces dispatched to the outer worlds simply mean the clans will need to buy increasingly larger numbers of Drake interplanetary replacement spacecraft. Well there you go my fellow citizens who are of the unsavory piratey sort, Alera I'm looking at you. Now we know why piracy flourishes so well in the Star Citizen universe. Provide a man with the means to fish, and he will fish for the rest of his life. In this case, it sounds like Drake Interplanetary has provided the pirates with everything that they would ever need. A cheap ship with an affordable weapons platform that, well, in all honesty, needs more rum in the cargo holds. So I look forward to seeing what you pirates do with the Drake ships, and I look forward to seeing to what CIG does in this month. Is this little teaser at the end an actual ship unveiling? Maybe it's related to the next great starship. Maybe the contestants will be designing Drake's next ship. We won't know for certain, but in the meantime, let's wrap this, <laughs> this week's episode. So as I mentioned, uh, not a whole lot to go over this episode. I thank you guys very much for tuning in. If you guys like my show, you can always click the subscribe button on the top left corner or on the fuzzy little hawk in the lower left corner. A little point of notice I'd like to make, I actually got my first notification from Google. Um, what that means is basically they are paying me now. It's very small, but at the same time it is something. It is money. I'm physically getting money for doing Star Citizen FM now. So I wanted to actually, again, give you guys a nice big thanks. Your views are what help my show. So if you don't mind watching in the future, that would be much appreciated. Stay subscribed, and when the game comes forward, I look forward to giving you guys some detailed ship loadouts, PvP tips, and whatever else I can provide on, even if it's just toast floating around in space. Until next time, I'll see you guys on Star Citizen FM. This is Dr. Hawk signing off. You guys all take care and fly safe.